I'm Jessica, a bookseller at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we continue to bring you the authors and artists you love and their work to our politics and prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase Brandon Taylor's book, Filthy Animals, which is amazing. If you haven't read it, get on lists. Um, you can also ask the guests a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And we will try to get to everyone's question, but we apologize in advance if we can't address yours in the time that we have with them. Um, finally, we want to thank all of you for being here with us today. We're so thankful for our family of loyal customers and new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's guests to Brandon Taylor and Vincent Cunningham. Brandon Taylor is the author of Real Life, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize, the National Book Critic, Critic Circle John Leonard Prize, and the 2021 Young Lions Fiction Award. And his debut short story collection, Filthy Animals, which Roxanne Gay says captures frailty and longing and the overwhelm of being alive beautifully. He is also the senior editor of Electric Literature's Recommended Reading, a staff writer at Lit Hub, and the creator of his brilliant newsletter, Sweater Weather. Vincent Cunningham is a staff writer and theater critic at The New Yorker. He was a finalist for the National Magazine Award for his profile comedian, Tracy Morgan. His work has appeared in The New York Times Magazine, The Times Book Review, Vulture, The Owl, The Fader, and McSweeney's. His debut novel, The Party Year, is forthcoming from Random House in 2022. Please help me welcome Brandon and Vincent to Politics and Grows Life. Oh, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Vincent, for agreeing to be here with me. It's so happy to be here. I mean, it's good. I'm so excited. Um, so as is the time-honored tradition of writers promoting their books, I'm going to do a short reading from the collection, and then we'll get into some, I think, really engaging, interesting conversation. So the story I'm reading from is a story called Anne of Cleves. Um, and I'm just going to read from the beginning, so you need no context, I hope. <clears throat> Anne of Cleves. On their first date, Sigrid asked Marta which of Henry VIII's wives she most identified with, and Marta choked on her white wine. Sigrid repeated the question slowly, and with a dawning chill, Marta realized that she was serious. I don't know much about that, Marta said and Sigurd pressed her lips together in what looked like a condescending grin. Marta didn't know much about history. She didn't know much about dating women, either. She had recently broken up with a man named Peter after he asked her to marry him and move to Belize. Every time he kissed her, she could feel a part of herself looking away from him towards something else that she could not then make out. But when, after three years together, he asked her to marry him, two things suddenly resolved into sharper focus. That she had been with him only because being with him was easier than no longer being with him, and that she'd been waiting for a moment when this would no longer be the case. Sigrid lifted her glass and examined it, and she didn't seem like she was in a rush to change the subject. She had the sturdy, upright patience of an elementary school teacher, her eyes were very green, Marta noticed. You're not much of an Anne Boleyn, Sigrid said, and the name darted through Marta's mind like a swift silver fish. There was something there, a glimmer of recognition, or, no, maybe just a desire to have the conversation over with. She had not thought much about history in some time, and years, really. She had studied chemical engineering as an undergraduate, and now she worked in a, at a waste processing plant in Baraboo. She might have told Sigrid this, except the look on Sigrid's face with its precise concentration wedged inside her like a splinter. Definitely not a Catherine Howard. <laughs> Stop there. That, um, I'm, I'm so glad that you read from that one, which I love so much. First of all, thank you for having me with you and thank you to Politics and Prose for this opportunity to just to talk and talk about this wonderful book. Um, but this this uh, story, Anne of Cleves, actually condenses so many of the things that I associate with your work, having read these first two of your books, which is um, an interest in history and aesthetics, 
but also kind of, um, I wanna ask you a question about character, Brandon. And, and I think this is a great way in just from what you just said, because it's like, what you do so well to me is bring a person into the body, into memory by way of the body, I guess. You know, it's like um, Sigrid presses her lips together and what, you know, Marta thinks of as this condescending way and all this, it seems to be that almost this gesture brings her back into the past and brings her back into what has brought her into this moment, this new moment. And it, it, it seems to me that one of the things that recur in these stories and there are many tones and many sort of what I think of as like time signatures almost, um, is this way of bringing back and back into memory, but through a kind of bodily closeness. Like, and I'm just interested in like, how do you think about, how do you build a character? Is it from the outside in? Is it from surfaces? You know, like just what we see of each other or is it start with a mental spark or how do you, how do you do that so well in these stories? Oh, well, that's really kind and generous of you. Um, so for me, character is, everything and for a long time as a writer I struggled because I thought oh I don't I'm not good at plot so I can't be a storyteller because I don't know how to do plot and then yeah. and then I had a series of teachers who told me that that plot was really just character and action and that character was like character couldn't be told character had to be revealed through like action, like a character is nothing if they don't reveal themselves in scene. And and so for me, like character and gesture and action, it all kind of flows together. And for me, like a character, you know, they often come first as a pile of clothes. I know that sounds kind of silly, but no. like for me, like I'll be sitting there and I'll think, okay, I have a blue jean jacket in my head. Who would wear that? Is it a women's jacket? Is it a men's jacket? Like, what is the cut? Is it vintage? Is it made to look like vintage? Is it, you know, from, is it fast fashion? Is it like truly like a work of craftsmanship? And yeah. then it's like, where's this jacket going and who would wear it there? And so like character kind of accretes first and foremost out of a set of exteriors. And then the work of like cohering that set of exteriors into interior weather and interior psychology and really trying to find that place in narrative where psychology becomes action and action reveals something of psychology to the reader. So I'm always, you know, in that kind of indirect, I'm always working via indirection to summon a sense of character. I'm interested in all that stuff, the kind of fleeting ephemeral sen like sense of a character you get, like those truly memorable characters. But when you try to like describe them to someone, it, it's like, well, you just had to be there. Just, just, you just had to, you just had to see it. It's like great yeah. drama and great theater in that way, I think. And so for me, character starts on the outside, but the outside is always a way in, you know, yeah. always looking for that interior weather of a character. I love that you mentioned theater there because I was kind of thinking, you know, I was thinking about what struck me so much about these stories. One of the, one of those things is that I think of you as in, many other ways, but also as like a, a wonderful set designer, right? Like, I, I love that you mentioned clothes because this happens all the way through this uh, this book. And I think of also, I think of the short story as in some ways the great sartorial medium in fiction, right? Um, there's one story, uh, it's called As Though That Were Love. And it begin, begins with this beautiful like salvo that is like, to me, totally again, about surfaces that you can then pull out of. I just want to read this so people can just hear this beautiful sentence. The swollen river, the soft ice, the world coming back to itself. This happens before you know any person, you know any mood, you know any setting. Um, and in the story, um, there, there are, you know, flannels and blankets and stews with potatoes in it. Like, again, these surfaces that kind that then ping back and forth with character. And it seems to me something more basic even than setting something like atmosphere is the word that I keep on thinking that. Like you, you know, you think very ardently and like intelligently about atmosphere. And like what is the, not just setting, but what is the feeling that these people are um, in and, are, and partaking of? What's like the mode that they're working with together? I just wonder like, how do you, is it just really like, 
like, do you look a lot, a lot, a lot of clothes and think about like, you know, how do you, how, how do you make that happen? Right? Like, how do you, what's the genesis of these things? I mean, the other thing is that there are a lot of dancers in here and that's another place that I think of as like, you know, atmosphere, like the bar and the mirror. It's just like, it, but it, it's not so all surface. It, it goes from surface into the, like the innermost part. Um, I just wonder how you pull that off. Yeah. Well, I, for one, I mean, it. when I was a kid, I would buy Vogue. I like I was like an eight, like a twelve year old black gay boy in Alabama with a subscription to Vogue, and so <laughs> I would just like, yeah. I would just like get the big in like the really sort of big like September and and spring yeah. issues, and I would sit first on the floor of Winn Dixie, the grocery store in Alabama, and just like flip through looking at the clothes, and not just like the clothes, but the models. And like looking at the stories that were being told through the editorial and and like just like soaking that in. I think that my narrative vocabulary, I always consider it kind of like much cruder than than other people's. And so like my narrative vocabulary comes out of having spent hours staring at models and staring at fashion editorials and thinking very deeply about like the story that's underneath the story. And, you know, I had a life that was just like deprived of specific language about my experiences and my feelings. And so I was always having to sort of like reach for the thing that was next to the feeling that I had language for, you know? And so I was always doing this approximation thing. And I really think that my narrative sense is just the collision of all of these like different inadequacies <laughs> in my in my development. And and so when I write, I'm really big on atmosphere just because I feel like I, I had a hunger to write before I had specific language for the things that I was writing about. And so I was really drawn to glamour. I was really drawn to these elegant, moody, <laughs> like fashion editorials. <laughs> and so when I was writing little stories as a kid, I was like writing like, these moody women and I didn't know what was going on in their heads. I just, <laughs> I just knew like something, you yeah. know, like something was going on in their heads. And I just got really good at that, like conjuring yeah. a sensation of something. And now I feel like as a writer, I can pair this really rich vocabulary of atmosphere and surface with now I think a finer understanding of human psychology. And sure. now I, now I can pen, now I can say like, ennui but like i feel like i have access to like 15 different shadings of ennui you know because i've i've done the work of just ingesting all the the shapes and such and and so i think it just comes from that i mean i i i'm a person who like when i watch a movie like i don't know what the story is happening but i'm just like very into the set design i'm like very into the feeling and the tonalities and the the nuances and shadings more than i'm even interested in like what the the plot is <laughs> <laughs> to some extent and that is the vibe i'm trying to bring i think to all my writing yeah i mean it, it i love this talk of tonality because to me these stories which for those the people who are on the uh on the zoom who haven't read these stories yet which you obviously should and you should buy this book um there is a kind of music right there are stories that are linked and then there are stories that are not linked to this kind of story that kind of threads them all together but um, it's almost like, you know, they're in a proximate key, you know, they, they'll, they'll sort of, um, one story is in C major and the other is in A minor and this like way that like sort of shuttles you back and forth and shows you their relatedness. Um, but I love what you just said about like, um, it sounds to me like aspirational. Um, and I, I've always, always, and I've never been able to figure out this relationship. I think there's a bad way to do it and a good way to do it. And I think you're uh, obviously you're doing the good way, you know, it's like, but fiction it has this relationship to aspiration. In some ways, it's not just a reflection. It's a kind of, it's a series of hopes or a series of projections or something like that. Um, and it seems to me that like, not only do you, like, is that apparent in what we've talked about, the surfaces or the atmospherics, but also in the characters. There are these characters who are in, situations that they've longed to be in, you know? Um, whether it's Lionel, who we'll talk more about as we go along, um, and many others, but it's, it, it seems like, you know, there is, it, it seems almost like 
meta fictional in certain places where it's like about the individual, the sole figure trying to enact some dream and then having all these tiers of obstacles that come, you know, is, is the, is the obstacle a big, like, so you have this aspiration, but then is the obstacle, the other big thing that you have to figure out or. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's interesting. I had not thought about that until just now, but I feel like in some ways, like the ongoing project of my work seems to be growing ever more interested in the project of aspiration. I feel like with real life, like that novel is very much about like the nightmare that is aspiration. It's like, yeah, oh no. All about it. Yeah. You know, it's like the the terror of aspiration. Yeah. And I feel like this book is like, well, look at all these people who had all these dreams and they're just like <laughs> trying. They're yeah. trying, you know. <laughs> Um, and I feel like my more recent stories, the ones that I've been publishing here or there, are like even more like metafictionally aware of like the very precarious, difficult reality of like feeling any kind of aspiration in the contemporary capitalist hellscape of America as like a black person. Like I yeah. feel like the the this sort of ongoing development of my work is in many ways the sort of growing awareness of whatever narrator narratorial intelligence is like more aware of like the precarious project of aspiration. <laughs> and so like I had not had not realized that until <clears throat> just this moment. I think in in terms of these stories, I think all of these characters as you say are in sort of various relations to aspiration like some of them had dreams and then those dreams crash and burns and they got dumped out of those dreams like Lionel and some of them had dreams like Harchis and as though that were love and he got what he wanted which was to leave his family and now he's in this position of looking back not with like total regret but with like but what if I were to feel regret about leaving it all behind what would that look like like right. maybe it's not all it was cracked up to be, and you know, like all the other sort of varying characters who are in various phases of regret. And so maybe it's like, maybe like the key of this book is not even, is not even like, I feel like if the key of real life, its relationship to aspiration was terror, I feel yeah. like the key of this book's relationship to aspiration is one of regret maybe, or like, slow simmering hostility <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we can talk a lot i have a question about terror slash horror which i do think is still present in uh filthy animals yeah <laughs> on a, like like on a very deep level there's a, a line in this book that chilled me truly um but um i do think about this in terms of you know wallace and lionel who both to me, if they have a similarity, right? It is that they care a lot about work. And it's not it, like aspiration, but through work, it's not an idle or empty aspiration. Um, in real life, there's so many passages about like, um, I remember there's like a lab scene and like him just sort of, uh, Wallace settling down with the nematodes and saying, you know, it feels impossible in the way that only possible tasks can seem, right? That like this sort of mountain of work that you have to settle into, or this, you know, person that, um, by the way, everybody should also buy real life if you haven't, it. it's a wonderful book. This, this sort of antagonist that Wallace has, he kind of, it's not her personality that he dislikes Dana's, it's that she, her experiments, uh, that, that like, she just doesn't work hard enough. Like she's gifted and she doesn't back this up with work. And you see this over and over with Filthy Animals, like talented becomes that, that sort of slur in Filthy Animals. Like, oh, you're talented. Well, you know, good for you, but where's your work, you know? And, and I associate this with you because I, you know, walk as an observer of your growing oeuvre and everything, like one of the things that I associate with you is like, among other things, like prolificness, like you work really hard. And so of course this makes me think of like, just what what work, and I think all fiction has something to do with work as well, right? It's like, we all have to ground ourselves occupationally, vocationally, whatever. But I do wonder like, you know, in light of this aspiration thing, where does work fall for you in, in, in fiction? Yeah, well, I think that it, I mean, it, 
it's sort of the great, it's kind of the great battleground of fiction of the moment, right? I feel like huh. all the white people right now are really like, all the <laughs> white people are just like, why is there no working class fiction? Which, by the way, is the question white people have been asking since like <laughs> the late 19th century, <laughs> early it's 20th big century. Thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they have been fighting about this for a long time. <laughs> Meanwhile, black people over here just like, I'm like, Anne Petrie exists. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah. The street is a novel. The street is out there. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I feel like work is like the great battleground of contemporary fiction in terms of like, <laughs> Are we doing it enough? Um, which I always find really funny. I mean, I think that, you know, because I write about, because I write about like queer black characters, many of whom are like working class Southerners displaced to the Midwest. Like those are never characters who were allowed to just be idle. Like though, like it just would not have made sense for me to write Wallace and not have him have like kind of a messed up relationship to work because as a queer black displaced summoner from to the Midwest, I have a messed up relationship to work because I grew up on a farm and I had working class parents. And so like work was gospel in our house. It's like, if you don't work hard enough, white people will call you lazy. And there's nothing worse in the world than being a lazy Negro. You know, like, yeah. like, like there is nobody who rides you harder than like a black grandmother on a idle Saturday, you know? And so, yeah. for and also, I mean, I think that I I would feel remiss if I weren't taking into account that like writing about contemporary black people, well, we're right, like these characters, the, my many of my characters grew up in like the 90s. And like one thing about growing up in the 90s as like a black person is that there was this ever present, like intense signaling from the culture that like your only way out was to work, i.e. through capitalism. <laughs> like your only way out of anything was to work really hard and, and yeah. capitalism. And I also just got a lot of signaling from my teachers because I would do really well in school with very relatively little effort. That always be like, well, there's going to come a day when you are so lazy because you're gifted and ever, you're not going to you're going to fail at life. And so like I was like working 10 times harder, <laughs> like I was like, like doing not just my homework, but like working four chapters ahead because I needed to always prove myself. And so I feel that in one way. Like I'm writing about characters who are trying to signal to the overculture that they are safe and that they are compliant through their working and that they're trying to like prove their worth through their working. And what happens is they reach the level they thought of as being the place they wanted to be. And then they look around and they're just like, oh, my life has been hollowed out by this <laughs> capital. Like as capitalism is wont to do, it's like, oh, all of that is meaningless. I actually am still subject to the same horrors of capitalism, racism, white supremacy. You know, like you're still subject to all those harrowing societal forces. And I think that's the real disillusionment at the heart of a lot of my work is like work is savior, but it's also not going to save you yeah. <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, I mean, and it, it's interesting because a lot of your characters I have, I, I love this, is that they are in these, um, one of the great tensions in your work is between um, STEM and the humanities. It's like a tension, but also a, a deep harmony, right? But there are many times where like somebody who's supposed to be working on math is instead reading a book and everybody else is like, dude, what the fuck, what do you do? Like, who cares about this thing, this other thing? And so it's also this thing that like, directing that work, that same insane thing that we all have. I too was raised in the 90s and I know exactly what you mean. Um, but directing that toward this like sublime uselessness versus, you know, there are many characters in your books who are like, uh, you know, his project got picked up by the Department of Defense, like the terrifying uselessness, usefulness of some of like these, uh, these things and the like, I don't know, like not laziness necessarily, but a kind of the uselessness that we all kind of have to become comfortable with if we want to care about art. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, I will say that I felt a little underprepared to have to deal with those sets of anxieties in art making because I was always on the STEM track and right. like, I, like, 
always, always told like, you're going to have a job forever. Like you're gonna, you're not doing <laughs> art. Like art yeah. is useless. Yeah. And then like, once I became an artist, I was suddenly like, wait, wait, like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, I just like sit here and then, <laughs> then I write and then yeah. like, that's it. What, yeah. what, like, what? Um, and now I, I have a feel bad in between. You got to don't, you know? don't forget about feeling bad in between. There's so much feeling bad. There's yeah, so much. You just, I just cannot escape it. There's so much um, terror and sadness. But I, I mean, it is, I, I, and I guess like the part of why I keep coming back to that in fiction is because I find it so fascinating. <laughs> like I, like there are moments when I feel really bad. I'm like, well, I, I could be like going and doing can literal cancer research right now. <laughs> I'm sitting here writing about like, a deli worker <laughs> going around Iowa city. This is yeah. not, it's like, is this the best use of my talents? Um, scant yeah. though they may be. And then, you know, and so like, I, I, I don't have an answer to that. And so I, I go to fiction to find, I don't know, maybe like peace of mind because I'm yeah. always like poking, I feel like I'm always like poking fun at like media writers and my, <laughs> my stories. I'm always sort of just trying to, re and, I, and like, there's nothing mean spirited in that. I think I'm just trying to reveal the absurdity, like the absurdity of being like a contemporary writer and like the absurdity also of like feeling bad about being a contemporary writer as though any, any of this, any of contemporary life had any meaning, you know? Yeah. It might it's, as well be useless, yeah. I mean, right? Like, it's so, it's so silly. Um, and so I feel like I'm just trying to capture some of the silly paradoxes in our, in our culture. Now that we have decided to be like a capitalist hellscape, there is nothing but absurdity. I think Camus yeah. tells us something <laughs> about this. Like, there's just nothing but absurdity to be found in all of it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you... It, this thing of productivity is funny because it's like one of the other things that I like about your work is um, how it deeply, for me, like deeply, deeply symbolizes place, which is like to me one of the hardest things. Um, and as you say, they're like, there are a lot of displaced Southerners who end up in the Midwest, which is this like on one hand, on the one hand, hotbed of academic and research productivity, but on the other hand, and in, in the way that we think about the, the country, also a kind of purgatory. It's like, so are you then gonna move to New York and then monetize this thing or move to LA or monetize it a different way or move to DC and become a part of the like sort of um, defense machi machinery, right? Like it, it's kind of from, you know, American, uh, American reminder of the South to American sort of, ambiguity of the Midwest. And I, I, I mean, I, and this also has to do with the atmosphere thing too. I like, I love, to me, the flannels like have to do with the Midwest in this thing. So what, I mean, I don't know. It seems to me, are, are you zooming from Iowa City? I am, I am zooming from the Midwest, the purgatory. I would, <laughs> I would love to hear from you just like about how the Midwest operates in your fiction. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, so the Midwest was, it's not where I grew up, of course. I'm very Southern, but I, I always viewed the Midwest as like the place, it was like the, the freedom land. I'm like, I'm going to get out of this South and I'm going to go to the Midwest. I'm going to be free and gay and nobody's going to be racist to me. And like, moved to the Midwest and it's like I suddenly became a Black person. Like I was always a Black person, but in the South, you're surrounded by other Black people. And like you're surrounded by white people who have seen a black person before and you yeah. kind of know where you fall in the racial hierarchy. But like in the Midwest, it's like, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it's like they have never seen a black person before. They have like a whole bunch of liberal feelings about that and they project it at you. Um, so it was quite it was quite strange. And I kind of hated it for a long time because, I mean, it was just like being on the constant receiving end of someone else's attention in a way that like white people in the South don't even, you can walk by a white person in the South and that you don't even exist. You know, like <laughs> you're just, you're just background. You're just foliage to them. Yeah. Um, but in the Midwest, you walk into a store and suddenly all of their very polite eyes are looking at you. And like, there was this one guy in my grad program who every time we went out, he wanted to talk about the civil war and he wanted to be like, but it's much better up here. Right? Like it's just, oh. it's like much better up here. And I was like, 
Well, I was like, well, you know, in the South, like, we didn't talk about the Civil War every five minutes. <laughs> um, so it was just like a weird place. And I feel like it was also the, but it was also the first place I lived on my own as like a mature observational intelligence. And so like, I think when you grow up in a place, you kind of have to leave it to be able to look back at it clearly. But because I wasn't from the Midwest, I was like, oh, these are people. Like these are, I was like aware of like a public consciousness. Like I just like was a grown up there in a way that I would never was in the South. I was always a child in the South. And so when I set out to write after first trying and failing to write stories about yuppies in New York City, not knowing anything about New York City. Right. I was like, what if I just wrote stories set in the Midwest? And then it worked. I was like, oh, because I know what the light is like in the Midwest. I know what the people are like. I know what the stores look like. I know what the, the architecture is like. Specifically, like Madison, Wisconsin, I know that so deeply and so well because I'd lived there. And yeah. So the Midwest is just like an interesting place to write about and to write into. And it's also like, this really interesting fault line <laughs> in this country. Like it's, yeah. it's just there, like, there are some days when I go outside and I run into like a person from the town, like from Iowa city and they'll say something and I'll be like, Oh, right. Iowa went red. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. But then I'll be like, Oh yes. Liberal apologia in the Midwest. Oh yes. College campus, gorgeous rolling lawn. <laughs> <laughs> and I just find that the collision of those two things, I find that to be like so fascinating and so interesting. And I don't know, I feel like I'm writing Display Southerners to the Midwest because it's just an interesting tension to me. And I, I kind of love it. And I don't know anything about the coasts. So to write about them would be, I just like, I, I've never seen, I've never, I mean, I've been to New York, but I wouldn't even know where to begin to write about it. Well, if you ever need a guide so that you can write <laughs> your yuppies in New York saga, please allow me to help you first of all i think you've got that covered though don't you have a novel coming out it is about an asp- an aspiring yuppie uh from new york so we we can you know when it happens we can talk about it. Oh, but please um, but i love what you said about this sort of um hyper visibility that like happened to you at a certain moment which you know is a theme in much of my favorite um fiction from like James Weldon Johnson to Ralph Wilson or whatever. Um, but I also, you know, it gives it, a, I mean, what I love about the main thread in this book, um, which I don't think it's giving away too much to say that it's about um, a young man named Lionel being sort of um, introducing himself or being introduced. I mean, I think the lines of caus- causality are one of the great interesting points of this um, into a sort of um, relationship with a couple named Charles and and Sophie. Um, And there is a line, I said that there was a uh, line that made my blood run cold. And one of the the, sort of the second story in this sort of um, sequence, which sort of variates with the stories that are not part of it. Um, Charles and Sophie are talking and, and Sophie says to Charles, you know, advising him not to hurt Lionel through this um, this initial but obviously growing intimacy. She says, um, he's a good boy, he's not like us. Um, which to me chimed in this racial way, but also like in this vampire way. Like it was just, it, it like total horror to me. Um, and I read everything after that with this sense, I mean, the pit that grew in my stomach as I let myself drop deeper into the lives of these people, it was just, I couldn't believe it. And I just wonder how, you know, what, I don't know, how did, was it, was there a, a sense of like trying to, you said that um, real life was really kind of about Tara, but I, I felt that in this too, like that there was <laughs> like a, like you were really creating a horror show, you know? Um, but that once again had all, I mean, all this beauty and all this allure and attraction that, you know, you're going down the road just like Lionel is, and there's kind of no two ways about it, but how do you, I mean, what is, what was the role of that horror? I mean, what, what, I don't know. How do you sit with that while you write it and how do you make sure it keeps pulling you down? I think down is the right direction too. Yeah, I mean, there, 
there's no up there's no it is all yeah, yeah. um <laughs> i feel like if my work has a trajectory it's always like it's all sort of um yeah i mean i i mean honestly i had a great time writing that cycle of stories i mean i i saw it as one of these like classic stories of you go to a potluck you meet someone who you vibe with and then you become increasingly enmeshed in their lives and what happens when all of it gets real complicated by human yeah. relationships. Um, and I, to me, that line where Sophie's like, you know, I'm glad it, I'm glad it sort of like initiated some line of thinking in your head because to me, I was like writing that scene. I was like, she's got to say something here. Like, what is she going to say? And then I, I was like, don't hurt him. You know, he's a good boy. He's not like us. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what she should say. And, like, that was the moment when it became clear to me that, like, Lionel and Charles were doing one thing. And Sophie was, like, Sophie had her own agenda. Sophie was yeah. playing, like, 3D chess while they were playing checkers. Yeah, and true. that was the line that revealed that to me. And I won't give anything away. It gets very complicated and juicy to my mind. It gets very juicy. Very. Um, and when Sophie ultimately sort of reveals her hand and and everything. And for me, like, the horror that's in that, I think partly part of that comes from Lionel because Lionel is, like, very fragile. He's just gotten out of the hospital after, you know, a suicide attempt. And he is really fragile and he he's like trying to figure out how to be back in the world again, I think like many people out there. Um, and so he's like presented with this, this like harrowing possibility of not only like getting back into the world, but getting back into the world in like the messiest, most complicated way possible, which is like <laughs> ending up stuck between two people already and a couple. He's, like, in this sort of weird menage a trois, you yeah. know, fully, fully a trois, I guess, if that can yeah. be said. And 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 the horror just comes from his anxiety about what's going to happen because he doesn't know if he can trust them. And he doesn't know, like, what they want from him. And he doesn't know what he wants from them. And, and so he's just really uncertain. And it was just a you know, writing it was fun, but really complicated because there are some moments when Lionel and Sophie are together, but Charles isn't there. And there are moments when Lionel and Charles are together, but Sophie isn't there. And there are moments when Sophie and Charles have a conversation about Lionel. And what I was always trying to do was always to triangulate the tension so that the tension never went down and so that it became only more mysterious and tense the more you found out about them. I didn't want to like withhold information. I wanted it to be so that when you find out more and more about what their plans are, you don't feel any relief. You don't feel any better knowing <laughs> that like <laughs> that that people are playing games. It only makes it more tense and more terrifying for like what's going to happen to these characters um, yeah. as they get more enmeshed and more involved. And sitting in it was like, I mean, difficult. Like. I mostly was just viewing it like a really fun puzzle and, and always trying to just like reach to that place that was like just beyond my comprehension of it. I was like, if I can see this and understand it perfectly clearly and I don't feel like anxious, then I'm not doing a good enough job. I've got to reach beyond what is comfortable yeah. and get the get these characters into uncomfortable situations. Because only when the characters are truly uncomfortable, I think, is the reader going to feel like something is really at stake. Yeah. You know, how does that connect with form? Because it's like, this is very much a story collection. Um, but there is this running thread through it that is narrative and very causal. Um, and how... How do you create, what's the difference, I guess, in, in, in this case between linked story and scene, right? Because you could think in, in lesser hands, these um, stories that are linked could be scenes in, a, in something that you would call a novella or a novel or whatever. How do you, how did you um, think about creating that effect and deepening that tension while also um, sort of honoring the um, the wholeness that is required of the short story as we think of it. Yeah, it was really hard. It was honestly like super hard to 
to sort of take the story of like Lionel running into two dancers at a potluck and then following them across like two or three days in Madison, like blowing that up across like six, five, six stories. Like that was like yeah. hard because it's, what do you, how do you divvy it up? Um, and I, I, at first I thought like, okay, like each one's going to be its own little scene and it's going to be that thing where it's just like one story chopped into five parts. And then I thought, okay, that's, that's a thing I could do. <laughs> but like, why? Like, what about each one felt urgent enough to be its own story? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that the process to sort of figuring out the right rhythm for the storytelling looked like a lot of drafts. So the first initial drafts, I think the first drafts of those stories did look like just like five discrete scenes from one larger story. And then it was just a matter of sort of building out from the core of each story, first identifying what the core of each story was going to be, and then making sure that I was make like letting each story do its own little bit of world building and compl- and like relationship mapping, making sure that every story felt as full and rich and complicated as possible. And also just like trusting that if I brought something up in one story, I didn't have to like nail it to the to the wall for the reader that like I could trust the next story to catch it and right. to sort of, you know, let it go on. And then if I sort of just blew up a moment in a character's life, like I think in the story apartment, which was like the the hardest story in the entire book to get right, because for the longest time, that story just felt like treading water. You know, it's a story where Lionel, Charles and Sophie all go back to the apartment yeah. And for the longest time, I mean, I'm talking for like five years, <laughs> that story just was like the bane of my existence because I was like, narratively, it's bookended by like the the proctoring story, which needs to happen, and the final story, <laughs> which needs to happen. So like, yeah. I'm real sort of, I've like given myself only literally like 45, like a 45 minute scene. A couple minutes, yeah. And I'm just like, how do you turn that into like a 12, 15 page story? I'm like, <laughs> what? And so then it was just like so hard to figure out like what is going on in this scene. And because it's kind of the last time we see Sophie, I think, in, in the book. And so it felt so important that she had this moment. And so it's like, how do I do all the stuff I've got to do, but not make it feel like this is the 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 bad story that's got to make the whole thing work. And so like it was yeah. just so hard finding the guts of that story and making sure that it worked in a way that was like true to itself as a story and urgent you know, and and needed to be a story, but also keeping this sort of scaffold of the the whole trajectory together. Like, like that is the one story in the entire arc where it literally, I think, I think the (laughs) first past pages was like the first time I, I truly believed that that story had earned its keep. Like it was, it was, that story almost did not get to come to the party um, just because I like, it was so, it felt so technical. It felt so yeah. schematic. It felt so much like that thing that you said, where it's like the, the tension between each story being a story first and foremost, sure. and just like filling space. So yeah. that story was just like, but I think in the end it earned its keep. It did its work. I solved the puzzle of it and I felt really, I felt quite good about it, but that is the one story I think where it was the hardest get that balance right i would agree that it does it 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 belongs oh thank you thank (laughs) you yeah um such that such thing Uh, last question before we go to the q a which people should if people have questions they should go in there right now and um we're supposed to be starting with that now but i do have one last question which is you just mentioned that this all starts at a potluck there's also a potluck in real life and i just want to know you know, this like thing of eating and I've, I have the same sort of, I don't know what it is, anxiety, excitement, um, just sort of intense relationship to going to eat with a bunch of people um, in this very like personality revealing way. I want to know what the potluck means to you because it, it like, it opens up so much in these stories that like in some ways is the beginning of trouble in both of them. And I just kind of want to know what it means for you. Like why, why does it matter? Well, I think that um, that's such a great question. I So, yeah, I think in some ways, like, the reason that there's a potluck in real life is because there was a, there was a potluck in 
uh, Filthy Animals first. I wrote that book first. And so I was like, right. you know what I love doing? I, lo I loved writing that potluck in that first book. Let's put another one in real life. Uh -huh. um, I think that a potluck is just a site of social collision. Like, And because I'm writing about people who are in <laughs> the gra like grad school often, like our social lives are so like governed by the potluck. There's just, there's a potluck in almost every, like so much of my life in grad school in Madison was just like potlucks and going to potlucks. And are you going to the potluck? No, I'm not going. Why aren't you going? Does that mean that you ate the host? Yeah. And I just think that there are these really interesting sites of social collision because everybody goes to a potluck with a different agenda. Everybody's going with a different agenda, with a different alliance. And it's often where people who kind of hate each other yeah. converge and all of it comes out and people are in corners whispering and gossiping about each other. You know, it's kind of like in literature, I think a potluck is a lot like a road trip. You know, it's one of literature's great locked doors. And I think any situation where you're getting people together and forcing them to show their hands socially <laughs> and you're locking the door and not letting them escape because they've agreed to eat this meal together. It's it's so great. Plus, there's just something real great about uncomfortable white people sitting around eating food. <laughs> like, there's just something delightful about those co-op chickens that everybody brings to the park. <laughs> yeah, it just, it brings so much. And also just like, you know, one of the great, another great joy of fiction is like, eating, you know, and, and how people eat and how they experience that and how it becomes oddly public and strange. So anyway. It's so public. Like, it's I don't so think public. we think enough about that. Like the weirdness of like, you are eating in public. Like this, it, like it's, <laughs> I think if we yeah. stopped to think about how revealing and strange it was, we wouldn't have potlucks anymore. No way. It's like, I eat in front of my family. You know, like it, you, I don't know. It's like gonna like indulge in this like primal, it's yeah. Yeah. You, do well, though, you know, it's it's you know. weird. It's the strangeness of it. But you know, such is life. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna turn to the Q and A. And okay. again, if people wanna add questions to the Q and A, they they they, sh they can and they should. Um, the first one is something that I'm interested in because I love your Twitter feed, which often has tweets that I never see. I often see it when you are like, I'm gonna delete all. I'm and time to delete all these before I you know before I get canceled or before whatever. So I love your approach to Twitter, which is. If you see it, good. If you don't, you don't. Um, but this person says, can you talk about what prompted your inspiring Twitter thread from last week or so, they say, about how to keep writing without mentors, support, or attention? What kept you going before your success? Mm. Yeah. So when I was in grad school, nobody would be my mentor. Um, and nobody would advise my thesis. It was real dark hours. Um, and I think you know, it's possible to internalize that and to view that as a thing about you. And I think what's important is to remember that first and foremost, you're writing for yourself and you should be writing for yourself and to make art that pleases you um, because you're the one who's going to have to live with it for all of eternity with your name on it. So <laughs> write for yourself and do it for yourself. And secondly, remember that art, art will survive any any negative detractors or anything else like if you if your art is important to you then that's what's important for the art making and protect your art making and just like keep doing it and don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't be an artist or that you shouldn't be making art um i think you've got to just decide what's important to you in art making and decide what matters to you and decide why you're doing it and once you've gotten to the bottom of those principles hold fast to them. And it's like anything else, you know, like once you believe in something, you know, don't let anybody take it away from you. Um, and for me, it was, I knew why I was writing. I was writing to write stories about queer black characters <laughs> experiencing malaise and ennui. And that was really important to me. And nobody was going to tell me that those subjects weren't interesting or worthy. And I didn't need anybody because the secret is the internet exists. So like, there's no secret information <laughs> anymore. There's no secret information. So I think you just got to make make great art and 
focus on your work. And whenever you feel anxious or sad, just get back into them drafts, you know, because that's <laughs> that's where the energy should be at the end of the day is in your drafts and in your work. And don't let anybody deter you. I'm glad you mentioned drafts because the next question from, <laughs> um, from the Q&A is about your revision process. And what is, so, so what is your revision process like and how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, so I'm a burn it to the ground kind of revisor. I'm not precious. Um, and I think I'm not precious because I know that I can generate a lot of words. And so I'm not afraid to toss out a 10,000 word draft. Uh, my agent can attest to this. I'm a burn it to the ground. So my revision process looks like I write a story, I print it out, I mark it up on paper, then I retype it word by word. Um, and I did that for this book. I must have retyped this book like five or six times. Um, and what I'm trying to do in revision is to move the story into deeper accord with itself. I'm just trying to make sure the story feels complicated and rich and interesting. And I try to find all the false notes in it, you know, whether that's the structure, whether that's the dialogue, character beats, or setting, or style. And once I've located all the false notes, I'll, you know, make some changes, then retype it, then print it, and then do it again and again and again. And for me, I try to be relentless in revision. That was something that Alexander, I think Alexander Chi said something like, if you want to be a writer, you need to develop like a stamina and an appetite for revision. And that's something that I try to hold fast to. And I have total faith in revision. I used to tell my, I used to, <laughs> I used to write notes on a draft, fix it in post. I used to like just fix it in post. Literally, there is nothing that revision cannot fix. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of reading your work very closely and ruthlessly and being relentless, no matter how many drafts it takes. Uh, you know, sometimes a story takes one draft, sometimes it takes 50. And I think you just got to be willing to get in there and put in the yards and get it done. I try not to be precious about most things in writing. <laughs> um, that is, that makes me a model for us all. I, not as good as that. So, I, <laughs> so here's a uh, Michael Naple asks. Um, given your discussion, I, I guess earlier we were talking about sort of productivity and work and all this. Um, he asks, has the pandemic affected your work habits and the demands and expectations you put on yourself as a working writer? Mm. Um, I think, I think one thing that I've been really good about in the last year or so is that I protect my no. And so I say no to a lot of things. Um, I say no to most things that people ask me to do just because I ask myself, does it serve me or does it serve them? And if it serves them more than me, I say no. Um, and so I haven't been doing it. I mean, I know it seems like I do a lot of work, but like I write very little these days um, just because I've been, I was sick for a while and then I sort of climbed out of a hole and I really didn't start writing again until earlier this year when I relaunched my newsletter and and those newsletters were really just an effort to get back in the habit of writing but one thing that the pandemic taught me is that health comes first and that the world will go on if you turn down opportunities you know like if something isn't right for you do not be afraid to say no I try not to put pressure on myself. I try to only say yes to things that feel feasible and interesting and that ultimately serve me and my art and not things that I, you know, like, oh, but wouldn't it be cool to write for such and such magazine? I'm like, well, yeah, but like, I, I can't write about race in America for 500 words in <laughs> two weeks. Like I, you know, and so I think, yeah, the pandemic was really clarifying in a lot of ways just because it, I had physical, you know, physical limitations I couldn't overcome at the time. And so I've just tried to really respect those limitations and to respect that the respect my work and my body and my my time. Yeah. Um, there's another question. I'm going to ask another quick one based on that one though, because I'm just I just want to know. Um, you, you said about the newsletter being about this sort of practice of getting back into writing, but it seemed to me that also it's like chasing down one of the things that I always think about in your work, which is this like deep, deep, deep interest in, um, it seems to me like aesthetics and morality, you know, like you're, you're, you're doing this. Um, I mean, I just, I love you as a critic and I love to, to see how you, um, it always winds back to the condition of the person, 
but also the I, you had a beautiful one about Helen Frankenthaler. People, it, uh, Brandon's newsletter is called Sweater Weather. Am I right, Brandon? Mm -hmm. um, and there was a beautiful one about sort of abstraction and book covers, and I mean they're they're all so rich. I mean, it's not just about the habit of writing. It's also like this other like this vein that you're trying to mm -hmm. get into, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I mean. It, it really did start that way, but it was also because I was reading so much criticism for like the first time in my life mm -hmm. and I had all these thoughts and I was like, well, I guess since I'm reading criticism, I can like do like little book reports as I, as I'm going. And, and I, and I, I don't know, I feel like I hit upon for the first time in my life, like real concrete language to talk about the things that I've always had in my mind. So about morality and art, like about like, the millennial novel, for example, it's always bothered me that people act like it's new when it's just repackaged naturalism. Yeah. And I started reading criticism and I'm like, oh, I finally now have language to talk about why it's repackaged <laughs> naturalism. And so it, it it's kind of like, yeah, I finally, like I started reading criticism and it gave me language to, to explore the stuff I've always been interested in, which is like morality and fiction and like moral rigor and fiction and what it is that we're doing when we write about characters and then how that's in tension with expectations set on us by like the overculture and like what does it mean to be like a black person writing black subjectivity um and but i do think that all of that got kicked off when i wrote the introduction for percival everett's erasure which is coming out uh -huh. in in the uk i think soon and they were like will you write this and i was like i've never written an essay in my life i guess i'll try it and getting to write about that book and grappling with percival everett's brilliant mind i'm like wow i wish i could be a person who did this all the time who like could yeah. write about books um and so the newsletter was really you know i never i didn't see it as like me being a critic but like me just trying to put my messy thoughts out there and i'm just glad people people have come along for the ride but yeah i mean it's it's yeah it's taking on questions i've long wondered about but never quite had language to to sort of build a, a framework or apparatus to to take on that makes sense um the last there are two other things in the q a one will take no time because it just says love the shirt brandon oh thanks the beautiful shirt um <laughs> and the, the last the last one i'll leave you with is um interesting how do you balance uh protecting the meaning of your work to yourself the sort of meaning between you and the text while still trying to get out of yourself to understand and maximize its meaning to others um mm. i guess i would also ask by myself like is there a meaningful difference between those things? Are you always writing with others in mind or is there a private you know, meaning? Yeah, I think that those two things, I think that I think that for a certain kind of writer, those things can be intention. And like by a certain kind of writer, I mean like a beginning writer, those things are very much like intention. Yeah. Like because for beginner writers, you kind of have to constantly bring them back to the, the what my, my comp teacher used to call the so what factor the, yeah. the like okay but like why are you writing about this the sort of thing that takes something from being a diary entry to an essay right. um but for me those things aren't meaningfully intentioned because and maybe this is just like all my my doctoral training but like for me when i'm writing something out i'm trying to really think about it i'm really trying to analyze it from all like sides and angles and so for me that just means total scrutiny and total sort of and like bringing my full mind to bear on a question or an idea and trying to attack it from everywhere. And I was trained to write by my PhD teacher in biochemistry, Judith Kimball. She always told me, take the thing you hold most dear and treat it with the most ruthless scrutiny. Like take the thing you hold to be true and just like try to disprove it using the most underhanded methods. And I think that when you do that, you you do arrive, even if you're writing about something really personal or going into some very personal headspace, I think you do arrive at like a real rich, deep, critical engagement with whatever it is you're writing about. And I think that that's the thing that readers, that's the place where readers enter a text is it's not trying to make them feel exactly as you felt when you were standing at the edge of the Pacific Ocean, but it's to sort of see, to bear witness to 
a total rich critical engagement with something. Um, and that's how I negotiate that is that I'm just trying to like create a space for the reader to bear witness to my total open engagement with an idea or set of ideas and be that in an essay or be that in a short story or a novel. That's what I'm trying to do. And, and that to me is like the height of like moral writing, you know, from the very D.H. Lawrence idea, which is the preservation of the true relation between things. And I think that's how you get that is through like this ruthless, <laughs> intense scrutiny. And the reader doesn't need to feel how you felt, but the reader should know here is a person who witnessed something and felt something. And yeah, that's how I, I think through all those messy questions, but you know, it sounds listen, much easier said than done. Yeah. For sure. Well, I mean, just to, before we hand it back over to the wonderful staff at politics and prose, I just want to thank you for meeting those encounters and showing us that messy uh, engagement with them because it has resulted in a wonderful book, Filthy Animals, which I was delighted to read and more delighted even to talk to you about. Oh, thanks so much. It was such an honor to get to talk about this work. And thanks, Politics and Prose, one of my favorite stores. I oh, love it. <laughs> Thank you both so much um, for being here and for your time in this amazing conversation. Um, we actually have one last question. Um, since we are a bookstore, we have to know, what are you currently reading or would like to suggest? Well, I would like to suggest the book here at my side, which is Claire Sestanovich's Objects of Desire. I love this book so much. I read this book back in January, I think, and I was so intensely jealous that I had not written it myself. It's <laughs> so good. It's it's like Anne Beatty. She's like the Anne Beatty of our generation. I love it. I love this book so much, and I hope everyone Wow. Well, picking that up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you asking me to? I, first of all, I would second that um, because Claire is my colleague at The New Yorker and I, I think she's brilliant and I too uh, enjoy reading those stories. Um, the other book that I would mention is the novel, um, The Life of the Mind, um, oh gosh, it's her, by Christine Smallwood. Um, which I loved. And it's another one of these books, like a lot of Brandon's work, honestly, which um, works in two ways, works philosophically, but also from the level of the body. Everything starts in the body. Um, and yeah, so I've seen Smallwood's Life of the Mind. Great book. Ooh, I've added both of those to my list. Oh, um, great. The good thing I'm working tomorrow, so I can just go in and <laughs> and then come home and watch um, you talk to Claire. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. I'll be yeah. here tomorrow talking to Claire about her great book. Yeah, so full circle moment. Mm -hmm. um, it'll just be you and my, in my apartment virtually again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you both so much for your time and to everyone watching. Um, your patronage is what enables us to bring you exciting events like this. And eventually we hope to do it in person, but for now, um, these virtual events are amazing and um, we get to connect with authors in a new format and ask some questions and peek into the living rooms. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so please support our wonderful guests and PMP by using the links in the chat to purchase Filthy Animals and Real Life. Um, and as soon as we have a pre-order link for Vincent's book, we'll send that out um, and pre-order that. Um, because if it's any indication, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, can't um, wait, can't <laughs> wait. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no pressure, but... <laughs> um, so be sure to check out our website for the most updated event listings um, and we have a great list to choose from. Um, we do hope to see you um, at our future events and thank you for joining for joining us this evening. And thank you again, Brandon and Vincent for your time. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, thanks so much. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>